cases of lost an AST really can't be um, overstated enough. It always used to be a reason behind homelessness, but it was kind of it was quite down in the mix. Um, what's happened since 2010 is you've had a very very rapid escalation in people who are having to approach the local authority for help because they've lost a tenancy. And what we're seeing on an anecdotal level from the conversations that my colleagues and services are having with people is that often sort of five years ago, yes, people would lose a tenancy. We know that insecurity has always been a feature of the private rented sector, but they could sort of self-serve and they could find another tenancy, whereas now that's simply not possible. So when that tenancy ends, it really does mean crisis point for someone. Um, it's also worth reflecting as well that the line that was previously at the top and has just dipped on relatives and friends um, not being able to accommodate someone anymore. We know that even when the real cause of homelessness is the loss of a, a short, short hold tenancy, people still tend to go to friends or family first. Going through the local authority, even taking out the kind of element of housing options is an extremely traumatic and sort of unwelcoming experience for many people. So we know that most people will rely on informal support networks before they before they go to the local authority. So we can sort of safely assume that some of that top line are actually also people who the private rented market has effectively failed for. Um, just pulled out the London specific stats here um, because the trend in AST is even starker here. As Suzanne said, we're now looking at nearly four in 10 people who are accepted as statutory homeless <coughs> coming straight from the bailiffs effectively removing them. And again, there'll be that element of informal help beforehand. Um, apologies to anyone who thinks it's a bit London centric to pull out the London figures. Um, but the bulk of homelessness in England mm. does come through the capital. And Peter made a very good point in our, um, in the workshop he ran, that any discussion about how we're going to reform the homeless legislation in England really has to think about how it's going to work for these most high pressure areas. So effectively, we do have to kind of London proof any discussion about reform we're having. Um, the upshot of this is basically local authorities are struggling to cope. Um, as everyone will know, it's not the case that there's sort of a pool of private landlords who let direct uh, households, a pool of private landlords who let people on uh, let people on the TA list. It's all the same private market that local authorities are having to compete in with their own reduced budgets. And what we've seen is Yes, it's been a very hostile environment for our clients, which is why homelessness has increased, but it's also an in increasingly challenging environment for local authorities to work in, which is why you've seen a big fall in the proportion of households and the number of households in TA who are in leased accommodation, which is often the most appropriate forms of temporary accommodation. So it's where people have self-contained facilities. Um, it's often where they can have a bit more certainty about where they're going to stay for the long term. And instead, you've seen far more use of sort of more ad hoc arrangements like annexes and sort of other nightly forms of TA um, with the big impact. But actually, everything that's in the guidance and in the legislation about suitability and making sure that when we help families, we are generally helping and making their situation better rather than worse is under pressure. The, uh, the single line here is the proportion of households who are in temporary accommodation but have been moved out of their area. And again, oh, sorry, that's a, a bizarrely labeled axis. But again, in the wake of that 2010 and the pressures on local authorities, you see a big sudden spike in the proportion of people who are being sent out of area. And again, that's particularly acute in London. It's worth adding the caveat that out of area isn't always a disaster, particularly in some boroughs, it might be preferable to move what can be literally across the road rather than several miles away in your own borough. Um, but generally speaking, that's not what this trend is about. It is about more pronounced out of area moves. Um, and you've also seen a big increase in the use of bed and breakfast. Um, as everyone will know, obviously local authorities shouldn't be using it for more than six weeks if it's a family with children. Um, in many cases, particularly in London, it's just not remotely possible for them to abide by that. And I think what we, what we frequently see on a services level is that effectively families are being sort of implicitly offered the trade-off 
So you can have a bed and breakfast within area, or you can have a self-contained flat out of area. And we know full well as advisors that if you challenge one, you're just looking at getting someone into the other. So it's a very, very difficult climate that people are working in. Um, just to emphasize that it's not just a London problem, because I don't want anyone to come away with the idea that London boroughs are struggling and everyone else is, is okay. There are hotspots of temporary accommodation across England. Um, and unsurprisingly, they often correlate with those cities with the most affordability problems. So Cambridge, Oxford, all areas with very high housing costs, very limited ability to kind of build out um, and with the impact that local populations are really struggling. Um, just to run over a bit of the ground that Suzanne covered in terms of the context, it is impossible to avoid the fact that this pressure on homelessness has happened at the same time as really big changes to welfare reform. Um, the local housing allowance available for private renters has been squeezed dramatically, and that's only going to continue for the next few years. Um, housing benefit reforms in the social sector now mean that you can no longer guarantee that social housing will actually be affordable for, for the lowest income households, and that is leading to housing, authority, housing associations having to look at who they house and who they can afford to house. Um, so it has been a very challenging context, which, as Suzanne says, has been deliberately created by government policy. We're not just working with sort of big impossible forces of the housing market here. Um, but they are still relevant, and it is worth noting that the private rented sector has become a far more sort of difficult climate for someone trying to house themselves. The numbers of people and the proportion of people in private renting has shot up dramatically over the past 10 years. Um, and that does mean that if you're a landlord, you have choice in a way that you perhaps didn't in some markets 10, 15 years ago. And what we're seeing time and time again is that it's households in the lowest incomes, particularly if they're reliant on housing benefit, even to part pay their rent, who are at the bottom of the sort of wish list when, local when landlords are letting their properties. Um, so all too often it's that combination of affordability and the fact that supply just isn't there, um, which is going to be a real big challenge going forward because I think there's always been this assumption and definitely it was something that underpinned housing options that you had the private rented sector there as a tenure of last resort. It may not have been desirable for people, it may have lacked security, but at least it was there, whereas now um, that's being challenged and we're seeing far more people who just can't access private renting, even with quite sort of intensive assistance. So that's a rather gloomy uh, picture of where we've kind of come through in our current situation in England. Um, now to talk a little bit about what's coming up. Um, it's fair to say that what's happened in Wales has been noted across the border. Um, the Department for Communities and Local Government announced before Christmas, just before Christmas, that they were they were keen to explore all options to um, to increase homeless prevention, including legislation. Um, it's a slightly odd phraseology for those of us who kind of know the housing options system and know how it works in England, because obviously, as Suzanne said, there has been an incredibly strong focus on prevention for the past sort of 10 plus years. It's not bedded in the legislation, it's there in guidance, but in terms of sort of the cultural practices of local authorities, prevention really is, is strongly embedded in the system. So it might be seen as slightly odd that the government have said they want to kind of turbocharge prevention. And for ours as an organisation that unfortunately often has to work with people who are challenging sort of unlawful decisions and gatekeeping by local, local authorities, um, it does inevitably raise those alarm bells about, okay, well, what does tar turbocharging prevention mean? Are we looking at a genuinely transformative model, um, or are we looking at in further institutionalizing gatekeeping? Um, I think it's encouraging that the signs from, from ministers and civil servants are that they understand the seriousness of this. This doesn't feel like the welfare reform packages, which were sort of announced in budgets and then had to be made to work. They are indicating that they want to get this right. They've said that they want to work with the voluntary sector. I don't think we'll see the co-development model that you've enjoyed um, here, but they are they are making at least some positive noises about not rushing this um, and recognizing that 
actually homelessness legislation is a very big serious thing for governments and it's not what you want to, to screw up. And it was quite encouraging to hear Suzanne remind us that actually reviews in the past haven't led to the sort of decimation of the legislation. Um, saner voices do occasionally prevail. Um, I think I don't I don't want to give the impression that there's sort of an ambivalence towards homelessness among the English uh, English sort of government. I think it's incredibly easy to look at what's happened with welfare reform, to look at what's happened with housing supply, and assume that there's sort of a willful disregard for people being made homeless. I don't think that is the case at all. Absolutely no politician goes to bed at night um, celebrating the idea that they could force people out of their homes. They just maybe sometimes forget to join up the dots between their policies. Um, but there is, there is a wish within government to not completely threw people over. So what we also saw before Christmas was some additional funding um, for various projects designed to help local authorities with that big, big backlog silting up in TA, um, some specific uh, money which will be given to the voluntary sector around what's being termed sort of innovative projects on prevention, and some money for the Department of Health to um, create more shared accommodation which obviously the welfare reforms with their emphasis on getting people under 35 to share accommodation has created a huge demand for, which so far the market hasn't catered for. Um, most interesting, I've just noticed that my title's missing as well. Um, most interesting is what they're proposing to do around the housing benefit temporary accommodation funding. Um, so at the moment, obviously councils get Councils charge a rent to, to households and households have to pay that and it's it's artificially high because it covers the basic rent and the local authorities' costs of managing uh, that property. That whole sort of system of stacking up the subsidies within housing benefit and paying that housing benefit through an individual has become increasingly problematic because of the benefit cap because it basically means people in temporary accommodation are more likely to be hit by that benefit cap. Um, which makes it far, far harder for local authorities to, to meet their statutory duty. So one of the things the government is doing in response is stripping out the management costs from the sort of basic rent for temporary accommodation. So the rent will still be paid by housing benefit, but the management costs will be paid direct to local authorities in a grant form. Um, grant rings some obvious concerns because the big benefit, the big plus point of that housing benefit model is if you get a sudden spike in homelessness, the funding sort of automatically flexes to follow it. With the grant model, there is the risk that if a local authority suddenly becomes a hotspot or just nationally homelessness goes up more than DWP were anticipating, we could end up with local authorities not having sufficient funding to meet their, their statutory duties. From government's point of view, the plus point is they think that this sort of fixed annual income will give local authorities more incentives to innovate um, I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens because obviously we know local authorities are already struggling to procure TA um, and whether they will actually take that money and effectively gamble on innovative solutions around prevention as opposed to just safeguarding it for where they have a duty remains to be seen. Um, also coming up, there is more welfare reform. Um, we've, we've had a huge amount to, to deal with today affecting both sectors, both private renting and social renting, um, and it's certainly not done yet. The overall household benefit cap is going to begin to be reduced in this April, um, and this is a real game changer in terms of how it will be felt by people. Until now, you're actually very unlikely if you're a kind of local authority housing benefit officer to come across many people who are affected by the cap. It's been a kind of London and the South East issue and larger families. That's going to change when the limits are reduced from April um, and the caseload is going to sort of more than double. Um, the biggest concern from our point of view is that local housing allowance, which is paid to private renters, is being frozen until 2020. Um, no one credibly expects rents to remain flat until 2020. Even DWP seem to have given up on their aspiration that if you squeeze housing benefit, you'll keep rents down. Um, so what everyone is expecting is rents to continue rising, local authority to flatline, and just a bigger unbridgeable gap for people between the money they have in their pocket and what a landlord's asking for them. And the risk is, is that that's only going to exacerbate that pressure from um, people losing tenancies and having to make a homeless application. 
Um, social rents are being cut 1% by a year, by 2020. I think this is largely positive from a tenant's perspective. This is just being done for safe housing benefit. The big unknown is what impact <coughs> is this going to have on supply as, as housing associations and local authorities have their budgets thrown out. Um, and what's been given very little attention is the, the LHA limits, which currently apply to private tenants, are going to sort of be introduced to the social rented sector from 2018 to new households. Um, whether this actually affects people is going to be hugely dependent on where they are in the country. Um, areas with very kind of uh, a relatively cheap private rented sector are going to be hit worse by this. Young single people under 35 are potentially going to be hit very badly by it. Um, and supported housing is also going to be hit horrendously badly. Um, but it's been, it's been sort of quite quiet so far. Um, the only final thing which I think is worth um, sort of dwelling on and where we are now is that because of that squeeze on temporary accommodation, you are beginning to see local authorities um, get more imaginative, but also potentially get a bit more desperate about where they're putting people. Um, so you're beginning to see local authorities actually looking seriously about how they can procure temporary accommodation, um, which is a very positive thing. It's about getting more supply into the kind of socialised system, if you like. Um, but you're also seeing more, um, not problematic, but potentially problematic use of things like prefabs. Um, shipping containers are being explored by some local authorities. And I think I have to commend the, the will of local authorities to innovate, and I have to completely acknowledge the pressures they're under. But I think it's just a trend to keep an eye on um, in terms of sort of where we go to in terms of what we deem is suitable for putting a temporary roof over people's heads. Um, Moving on quickly to the biggest challenges coming up, undoubtedly lack of supply is the number one issue. It's why people are becoming homeless in the first place. It's why people are, are sil silting up in, in TA. I think the big challenge is the legislative changes that we have going through in England at the moment are only going to make this worse. Um, we have right to buy being extended to housing associations, which will have a long-term impact on supply. Um, but the big problem is actually in the short term that's going to be funded by forcing local authorities to sell off their high value uh, council houses. So you're going to have the extremely perverse situation that in those most expensive areas where the pressures on homelessness are most acute, local authorities will be legally obliged to get rid of the housing stock, um, which is just a nightmare scenario waiting to happen. Um, and I think our, all of our estimates point to this continuing to increase homelessness, but also continuing to increase people's stock in TA, because it's just really going to limit the options available for local authorities. Um, you know, they, they'll lose their social housing, and that LHA squeeze is going to dampen any wish they have to be using the private rented sector more to rehouse people. Um, Touching on to that, welfare reform, I think, is probably going to continue to be the second biggest challenge. Um, the government, once again, is showing a kind of a lack of joined up thinking between DCLG and DWP. The Localism Act in 2011, as you'll recall, made it much easier for local authorities to, to use the private rented sector to rehouse statutory homeless households. Prevention has always been based on some sort of assumption that the private rented sector is there and affordable as an additional tool. Um, the local, allowance, local housing allowance changes just come in and cut right across that and make a whole tenure effectively unaffordable for people in low incomes in many parts of the country. Um, <clears throat> I've put the slightly offensive picture up there because I think it's important for us to remember exactly why the welfare reform uh, debate is so difficult. For those who can't see, it's a, a ban with the bumper sticker, the child is for life, not just for benefits. Um, and I think this is something that we've sort of we've had to reflect on a lot with our campaigning hats on, that you can make a lot of very good arguments about what's happening to the housing market, what's happening to statutory homeless figures. Um, but the uncomfortable truth is welfare reform has become an incredibly politicised debate. And at the moment, the government feel there's more to gain from cutting um, than there would be to lose from, from the consequences that uh, you and I probably spend more time talking about. Um, I touched on with the supply changes, the reform of social housing is going to be a big challenge. Um, we're losing the supply via right to buy and um, sell off of high value council houses. But the home housing planning bill which is going through is also going to get rid of security of tenure. 
Um, so the risk is, is all of that churn and insecurity, which is currently driving up homelessness in the PRS, we risk replicating in the social housing sector. Um, so really big long-term challenges there. Um, final big challenge for England is what we do about the enthusiasm for the Welsh legislation. Um, there is a lot of a lot of interest in it, and there's certainly a lot that we should be looking at. Um, I think there are big questions about how much of it can be replicated in England, least of all because of the London problem and high high costs there. <laughs> Uh, our supporting people funding is also in a very different place, which might make it more challenging. Um, and also with my cynical hat on, I can't get away from the fact that I know full well there are lots of people within Whitehall who hate the 77 Act anyway and would absolutely love the fact that there's a review and a consultation and there's a whole host of opportunities to, to check out everything they don't like. Um, so looking more positively in terms of what we think needs to change to begin to unpick this, um, Operating that local housing allowance is an absolute must. The private rental sector just isn't working at the moment for people on low incomes. Um, we need sensible funding for temporary accommodation. Too many local authorities, particularly in London, are having to, to cross-subsidise it, which has been fine for some up until now, but with their budgets continuously squeezed, that's just going to crumble at some point. Um, we need to talk seriously about the PRS security and conditions so we can stop some of that long-term pressure of people being made homeless from private tenancies. Um, legal aid and access to timely advice is essential if we're talking about genuine prevention. Getting to people early, advising them well is one of the best things you can do if you do want to do prevention properly. Um, and finally, we absolutely need more social housing, both to prevent that kind of constant churn coming through from the private rented sector but also to make sure that local authorities have a full range of tools to rehouse people. It's my risk stop talk. I'm already technology challenged here. I don't know what to do with this. That's okay. <laughs> this one? Uh, yeah, or oh, you yeah. can use the couple. So you've got that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, not so I start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased to be here. My name's John Pusey. I work for Shelter Cymru, um, and Shelter Cymru uh, is uh, marking. No, I, I, I take the point that uh, Kate said uh, we can't celebrate, but we're marking 35 years of work in Wales this very year. Very early in the life and the history of Shelter Cymru, we became independent from Shelter. So we are an independent Welsh-based charity, managed in Wales, directed at the issues in Wales. Uh, we're a Welsh organisation. Can I say any clearer than that? <laughs> in, your bags, you will, in your bags, you will find a card um, which um, uh, invites you to become a campaign supporter of Shelter Cymru. So, so please consider becoming a campaign supporter of Shelter Cymru. Um, you, you don't have to go in your bank, just go to the website and you can become a campaign supporter. Um, so that's my, uh, and obviously I should say that we, we have an extremely important and strong relationship with uh, with Shelter. We call Shelter our sister organization. I don't know what Shelter call us, probably <laughs> something rude, I don't know, but we call them our sister organization and we work very closely together uh, on a whole range of issues. Um, so what am I gonna talk to you about? Uh, it, do you know, I knew this was going to happen. I mean, you've had all these really good speakers today, and I, and I just I was all ripping up bits, and I, well, that's already been said, that's already been said, and Kate says, done a brilliant analysis of what's going on, so I rip that up as well. Um, but what I'm going to do is tell you what we had in terms of homelessness policy and practice and law in Wales, tell you why we wanted to change it, tell you where I think we are now, although that's tough at the moment, because it's early days, and then I'm going to tell you where I think we should be going next. Is that all right? Um, just a, a little thing for you to think about when it comes to the end session. Uh, I, I, I was interviewed on the radio the other day, and um, I was asked two questions, which I, I was sort of something caught out by, but I, I'll, I'll give you the question. Shall I? One, one was, uh, if you're going to be homeless, what's the best country in the United Kingdom to be homeless in? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to answer that now. Maybe you want to vote on it later or something, I don't know. And the other one was, um, is it easier for homeless people now than it was 10 years ago. So not is it easy to become homeless, but is it easier for homeless people now than it was 10 years ago? So I'm not gonna answer those. 
but that might be something for a discussion later, yeah? Okay, so on we go. Um, so uh, we've already, I think we've already touched on all this stuff, so I'm gonna be quite quick on this one. Uh, drivers of homelessness in Wales are, of course, pretty much the same as you've been hearing from, from other speakers and Kate earlier. Issues of availability, cost, insecurity, private rental sector, uh, losses, relationship breakup, and obviously welfare cuts. So that's very, very broadly the, the kind of stuff I think you've been hearing. Uh, just to emphasize the point that Suzanne made about um, an awful lot of people who become homeless never had a home in the first place. I think that's, that's pretty very true people who, who simply haven't been able to get on any kind of housing ladder. Well, I want to add something else to it though, which is um, as failure demand, you know, our system thinking term. Um, what we're certainly finding in our casework is uh, that there's a lot of people coming to us because of a failure of another service to do their job properly and fully. Now, I'm not suggesting it's 80, 20%. That's just the thing I downloaded, yeah? <laughs> uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't work out how to get it off, because I'm, uh, uh, but, but so forget the numbers there. But it is quite clear that a lot of people come to services like ours because their housing benefit wasn't sorted out properly, or they didn't have a discretionary housing payment uh, put in for them, or, if, or they they're, perhaps they're exhibiting signs of antisocial behavior and support hasn't been put in place for them. So they, so, you know, so they could be helped and actually homelessness prevented. Um, okay, uh, fairly controversial, but some people now are coming to us because they can't get access to affordable homes, RSLs, because the pre-tenancy assessment says you can't afford an affordable home. Look that one out. Um, some people are losing their tenancies from RSLs quite early in that first year. What do we call it? Probationary year or something? Right. Start attendance, thank you very much. No work before together. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, recently we were, I, I'm aware of a, a case very recently where a, a single parent with very severe mental illness lost her home in that first year in a housing association. Uh, children put into care and she's come to us. What's going, why? Uh, surely, surely if somebody has those kind of problems, the housing association should become aware of that. They should be, be working with people and, and supporting them rather than actually getting to a situation where that person is evicted, ends up in hostel accommodation, and the kids go into care. Systems failure, I would call that. Um, failure demand. So I think it's really important that we address that issue as well. We're making sure that everybody is doing what they can in this country, in Wales, to make sure that people are not put under even more pressure. I mean, there's other issues going on. We know that, for example, People are getting chased for very low council tax arrears, which obviously has knock-on effects uh, to their ability to pay for rents, etc. Um, one local authority decided to call in all its housing benefit claims, and then and then uh, and then later failed to you know uh, properly re-sign people up. What's you know there is no need for these kind of pressures being put on the citizens of Wales at a time when it's all very already very difficult for people in those circumstances. What we should be doing is demanding that our public uh, services show a bit of solidarity with, with citizens here. Okay, so I've had me rant. <laughs> Might have another one in a minute. I'm gonna take you back in time now. I'm gonna take you back to 1977. Um, uh, this is simply to prove that things change, and things have to change. Um, it was a long time ago, 39 years ago. Um, that, that, I didn't even know, on computers, I don't know what it's called. Right? Anyway, that's Ian Botham, uh, his first series, Smashing Australians, excellent book. We've seen Ian Botham now. I mean, it's not like that anymore. Uh, but that is actually me, and I've only put that up there because <laughs> I was challenged. Some, some people believe I've never really had any substantial hair. I had a lot of hair once, okay? Um, so that's me in 1977. I actually got married in 1977, so it was a good year. Um, and of course, the Homeless Persons Act uh, uh, was uh, uh, enacted, or actually, as Suzanne said, enacted the following year, but the 1977 Homeless Persons Act is what we lovingly call it, and it was as uh, Suzanne's already said today, a very important milestone. I think one of the Im really important aspects of that act was it actually brought together statutorily homelessness and housing. Now that might sound crazy now, you say, well obviously homelessness has to do with housing, but actually it was not recognised in law until 1977. I mean there were various circulars knocking around, I think Suzanne wasn't there, saying you really should join these two things up, but actually it wasn't actually underpinned in law until 1977. So a very important move forward and it was a pioneering piece of uh, legislation, um, very significant. But uh, look at it, I mean, you know, it's, it's, look at this car, I mean, actually it's quite nice really. <laughs> we don't use computers like that anymore, do we? I certainly don't look like that anymore. 
Ian Botham doesn't look like that. They're too, that's not royal going on down there. Those, those keep coming back at all, just don't they? But there we go. Um, so I'm, I'm merely putting that up uh, to demonstrate that things are not the same. Things change. When that legislation was passed back in 77, there was a completely different housing environment. There was still significant council house building going on back in 1977. People's aspirations were different back in 1977. Um, and so, uh, for some time now, although strong defenders, as shelter is of the, the legislation in England, perhaps you have to be in England, as strong defenders in, in, in Wales for many years in the 1977 Act, it became clear to us and others in the country that maybe we need to start thinking about a new way of actually addressing the issues of homelessness. <laughs> what were the problems? Uh, the problems that we were trying to leave behind in the old legislation <laughs> was that, first of all, it was very process driven, um, very bureaucratic. An uh, awful lot of policing around things like, you know, are you uh, in priority need? <laughs> are you intentionally homeless? Have you a local connection? Huge amount of energy going into those kind of barriers, almost an attempt to say, hopefully we can trip you somewhere, we can stop you somewhere on this trip towards being assisted. So awful lot of energy going on there. Very selective, of course, because uh, you have to, under the old legislation, priority need or certain vulnerable groups were the only ones that were actually fully uh, assisted. And so therefore many people, as has already been stated today, particularly single uh, homeless people, were effectively left out of any serious help or they were simply given lists of uh, bed and breakfasts or, or whatever. So extremely selective, leaving lots of people out. Uh, and punitive, um, intentional homelessness. Intentional homelessness is just, I, I mean, actually, if we go back to 77, the only reason we have intentional homelessness in the act was because this is answer was pointing out at the time of a minority Labour government. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, the reason we have intentional homelessness was because it was the deal that had to be struck with the opposition at that time uh, to get the legislation through properly. Uh, and I know that at the time, uh, certainly there were people on the Labour side were saying, you know, once we come back in 1979 with our majority, um, <laughs> we'll get rid of this intentional homes, this is absurd, we don't want that. Yeah? Uh, but it is, isn't it? It's a hangover from the poor law, intentional homes. It's that kind of punishment idea that somehow or other you're trying to get something or nothing and you will be punished in some way. And it's all very, it was also very much an all, and it is obviously, all, a very much an all or nothing approach. You're either, you're either in, you're either in one of these priority need groups <laughs> Uh, or you're not, and if you're not, then you don't get much help, I'm afraid, off you go. And that kind of, over the years, drove a, a particular service culture, uh, I would argue, and it was one that was very adversarial, um, so applicants and the services, um, it, it would often have very difficult relationships. Um, there was very little trust between applicants and, and service providers, and, obviously local authorities I'm talking here, obviously very reactive, it simply responded to the issues as they were coming pouring in. Uh, I would argue it was quite patronizing um, and, and created that kind of victim mentality amongst people. I mean, essentially, under the 1977 Act, as tweaked over the years, you had to go in and be desperate. You had to say, I'm in a desperate situation, help me. Um, so and I know that uh, talking to people, for example, in uh, women's aid refugees, they would say, look, on the one hand, we're trying to build up confidence, trying to make people take control of their lives, and then we say, no, you know, you're going down to the local authority now, so don't, don't be like that, actually go in, go in in a mess, start crying, you know, look bad, <laughs> don't be like, I mean, it, it kind of, it was the opposite of aspirational in many ways, it drove that kind of culture and those kind of relationships, and of course, there was a huge amount of um, litigation, a huge amount, I think it's one of the most litigated, I just invented the word there, uh, area of, of public law, a uh, um, huge amount, which, which is constantly adjusting and changing the legislation at the, uh, and, and the way it's interpreted at the edges. Um, so for all kinds of reasons, um, that's supposed to be shown change. And what, what you do at two o'clock in the morning when you're trying to rush a presentation. Um, so for all kinds of reasons, I think, uh, we, there was a, a strong feeling in Wales um, that we want to change those kind of, that culture. Um, uh, and that it was time for some uh, change. Uh, and so in 2012, we had uh, Homes for Wales, a white paper, uh, which was actually, in terms of both its analysis 
and some of his ideas was really very, very groundbreaking indeed, excuse me. So, for example, it, uh, its analysis was entirely that the current legislation, the old structure that we've, we haven't got anymore, we did then, uh, did, uh, there was an awful lot of time spent uh, policing it. There was a lot of um, opportunities for freeing up capacity to actually assist people. But really what we should be looking for is a solutions-based approach to people. That what we should also be looking for is a way of avoiding that kind of selection process, that priority need thing. That, that, that maybe we should even look at ending intentional homelessness in some way. So laid out quite a, a menu of really, but for those of us in shelter companies certainly, of quite exciting opportunities and prospects. Um, inevitably, of course, white papers didn't quite turn in exactly as they were into uh, legislation, but nevertheless, there's some important aspects of it that, that are still there. Um, certainly, the important uh, uh, idea of actually opening the door to everybody is a key one the duty to prevent homelessness in all cases. So in other words, you don't, it's not an issue about whether you're intentionally homeless or priority need. The, the, in the first stages, local authorities have to be absolutely blind to that. What they have to do is actually try and uh, prevent and, and or alleviate your homelessness. So that was a big step forward, I think, that everybody coming through that front door uh, should be doing that. Um, <laughs> the concept also of, of early intervention, as early as possible. So the 28 days business of uh, of you know when you're threatened with homelessness and, the, and therefore there's a duty to assist you that's pushed back to 56 days but certainly all the advice and guidance and the expectation is that local authorities will actually go even further beyond that plan. they need to be creative and innovative and not just stick rigidly like 56 days get in there as early as possible prevent the homelessness um, new duties on uh, rsls to collaborate with local authorities to to assist local authorities in preventing homelessness and obviously uh, I would suggest not to create homelessness themselves either, but certainly to assist local authorities in that prevention work. Stuff that maybe is less helpful in our position, in our view, is the idea of discharging the duty, the full duties into the private rented sector. I mean, in a sense, it was a quid pro quo, I, I suppose. I mean, the argument was, if you're gonna open up the front door to everybody, uh, then if we're simply gonna stick to putting people in, only into social housing, uh, then there's gonna be a difficulty. So. A, a part of the, if you like, the, the, uh, the negotiation of this new legislation was the idea of discharging the private rental sector, which of course happens in England as well, doesn't it? And uh, we're also been promised the end of intentional homelessness in 2019 um, for families with children. I think you get a kind of two, one strike and you're out thing. Now, I think if you're intentionally homeless again, but in a period of time after that, then you may be found intentionally homeless. But the idea is to convert the concept of intentional homelessness, which after all is when families, households have got into some issues, some difficulties, maybe behavioral, whatever, that actually creates the loss of their home. But actually what we should be doing, what local authorities and their partner organizations should be doing is working with those families, working with those households and looking at ways in which we can actually support them so that they can maintain a tenancy. Not to say you're intentionally homeless, uh, you can have some b, &B for 28 days, bye, no. Actually, it's about how do you work and assist with people in those circumstances to give them sustainable options. So that's very promising, I think, uh, uh, and we'll see if that develops. I'm not entirely sure if there's a trigger in the current legislation. I'm looking at my, my policy expert here, but uh, certainly that's the, the expectation is by 2019, intentional homelessness will disappear. The other important thing about the legislation, I think another important aspect of the legislation, and I meant to say it when I was talking about the 77 Act, is that... Uh, like England, um, there was an awful lot of housing option stuff going on, but it was all outside the legal framework. Um, so it was unclear whether that was good stuff or bad stuff, or I think Suzanne suggested probably a mixture of both. There's almost certainly some good practice going on, local authorities working with people, prevent homelessness, but there was also some pretty bad stuff. And I think the key thing was that we were finding that a lot of people were coming to us and, and, and really not aware that there could have been another way forward through the, leg through the legislative pathway. Uh, so therefore, kind of things like tri the triggers that might help people if they, if they get into a situation when they might lose their home were not there. They were unaware of rights and you know, the, the, a whole bunch of things there which was causing real difficulties because all that stuff was going on outside the legal framework. The new legislation in Wales is effectively bringing that inside the framework. So we are able to monitor what's going on. We are able to test 
and watch good practice, we are able to see how effective interventions are. And that's a very important aspect, I think, of, of the new legislation. However, uh, and, and what kind of culture do we hope this new legislation drives? Uh, well, certainly one of partnership. I think that's really important. Um, I've already said about RSLs cooperating. There's also an expectation from the Welsh Government on all of us in the business in Wales to work more effectively together on behalf of people facing or experiencing homelessness. My organisation is now developing a whole uh, a range of local protocols with local authorities about how we can work more effectively together with them, uh, how we refer effectively together. We, obviously, we're not losing our independence in this, but it is about understanding the, what, what each other's responsibilities are and what each brings to the table and what particular areas of expertise we can bring. And we're already working in some local authority teams where that seems to be working really well, uh, where we're able to provide the particular expertise and insights that, that our team have uh, and, and able, therefore, to assist those local authority colleagues. And that has been leading to more effective, the important thing, more effective outcomes for people facing or experiencing homelessness. So quicker decisions, more effective decisions, more sustainable outcomes. So certainly uh, an expectation of greater collaboration. Yes, you're right, the top's missing in all these, isn't it? <laughs> I actually said partnership culture. I wish somebody had told me earlier. You probably missed some of the jokes. Um, uh, and the other one, the really important one, the more, most important one, is, is developing that greater collaborative partnership with the users themselves, with citizens, people who are actually accessing those services. I think that's, that's absolutely key in this. So one of the things that certainly that there is an expectation that local authorities will do, and most are doing, is, for example, developing personal housing plans with people so that they're actually able to work with somebody and get an agreement about what is the route, what is the direction of travel those people want to go, where do they want to get to, how can the local authority help, what partners can be deployed to actually assist in that pathway, uh, and, and, there, and you've also got a way, therefore, of monitoring and checking how effective that is. But even more than that, um, it is our view that citizens, uh, applicants, users should have a much more direct relationship with uh, services, that they should actually be res uh, react, uh, responding to, to how, those, how effective those services are. They should be making recommendations about how those services can be redesigned and made more effective and accessible. But basically, we've talked in bef before in Wales about a citizen-centred approach. We really should be deploying that in uh, the way we work with people facing or experiencing homelessness. Shelter Cymru has a project called Take Notice where we have a group of people who've, uh, who've uh, been homeless and who've uh, experienced homelessness services and they are currently uh, on a kind of round of local authorities doing risky shops on their services and feeding back to those local authorities how effective or not they think those services are and how they can be improved. So getting that kind of loop going with citizens I think is absolutely key. Um, and there's one other thing, and I believe it was discussed in one of the workshops this afternoon <coughs> that we think is really important, and that is getting, making sure there's a citizen's, uh, an applicant's, a user's view of the effectiveness of prevention, the sustainability of prevention. So what we have at the moment is a, as a measure of prevention of homelessness, which is very much the official measure, the, the, and I say the official as a person, somebody working for the local authority, what we need is a, a countervailing what right term? A countervailing view from the user. So a local authority A says we think we're very effective in 78% of these cases. What are the users saying? What are they saying? Are they saying 78%? Are they saying 50%? Or are they saying even better? We really do need that, that, that user experience to be fed directly in to understanding how effective these interventions are. Um, Right, well, I'm going to talk, I, I'll move on because I am aware that a lot of uh, stuff has already been discussed. But just to quickly run through some early numbers, um, again, I know in one group you've been discussing probably slightly a lot more in depth about these numbers, but just to give you an idea what's happening or what may be happening, but it is really early days. I mean, what have we had? Two quarters uh, of, of figures. So, yeah, you know, I mean, but the, the, after an assessment, the, the Section 66 duty to prevent homelessness. So quite a high proportion already showing up there, over a third uh, are being uh, assisted at that level. Um, duty to secure for all homeless households, second 73, 14%, and then the actual uh, duty to secure for households in priority need is much lower, of course, than uh, it was under the old legislation. And you would expect it to be, wouldn't you, because uh, there's been more prevention work up here. So 
I mean, there's a, there's a lot more to be said about it. There's a lot more monitoring needs to go on. I know uh, Pete's um, done some work on the dropout at each of these levels. I think he's saying about 20% dropout at each one. So there's a huge amount of questions over all this. And it's really very early days. Come back in a year or two, I suggest we might have a better idea. But it, it, there, there's something here. There's a pattern, a very early pattern, I think, starting to emerge. Um, early days, yes. But uh, have, been more, have more people been helped? Uh, well, I don't know, possibly. Um, I've got a 29% figure. You can well, simply be saying possibly and coming up with a precise figure like 29%. <laughs> I'll tell you why I've got 29% there. It's because Welsh Local Government Association, uh, Local Homelessness Network, has done some work on it. And they think it's gone up by, they think the number of people assisted has, has increased by 29% uh, in the two quarters this year compared to the two quarters of the previous year under the old regime. Um, that, I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, there, there's two reasons I'm not sure. I think it's much harder to count households under the new system, and we need to sort that out. Uh, Pete's given them a methodology, haven't you, Pete? Yep. Yeah, he's told them how to do it, but they haven't done it yet, uh, them being the, the Welsh Government. Um, and the other reason is that it might actually be that a lot of those extra people were people who were originally being helped, or not the same people, obviously, but groups of people who were being helped under the housing options outside the legislation who are now being bought inside the legislation so they will never be show an increase. There we go, so we don't really know. Certainly more recorded prevention work appears to be going on. I think intentionally homes is still higher, I know there's a dispute about this, and it still is early, but we're getting sort of 5% in the uh, uh, um, intentional homelessness, which is higher proportion than we had under the old legislation. It's actually less people, of course, because there are less people getting at that point, but proportion is still high, so we need to keep an eye on that. But there is the not homeless issue. Um, overall, those first couple of quarters showed about a third of <coughs> people being found not homeless by local authorities on uh, at the initial assessment. Now, if you actually look at each local authority, the, the variations are absolutely enormous. I mean, some local authorities are coming up with zero. In other words, everybody they assess is homeless, and some are coming up with 80% um, on plus. You know, most people we <laughs> assess are not homeless. So there's obviously an issue here about interpreting uh, this and actually getting the, the data right on it. Um, one of our concerns <coughs> is that some of, a lot of these not homeless uh, decisions are where people, uh, is where the local authorities move very rapidly and got somebody into accommodation. So by, by the time the assessment's finished, or, or gave them some options, so by the time the assessment's finished, they're saying you're not homeless now, even though they were homeless when they came. Now that, if, and I think that is happening. It has been happening. There's one local authority that, that, that said, yes, that's the way we've been doing it. Shouldn't we do it that way? No. Because the whole point of legislation was to bring it inside the, the framework. Uh, and interesting enough, that particular local authority has now changed its practice and now it's gone from 80% to like 20%, 20, 30%, something like that. So, so that practice, that old problem that we had about the work taking place, the options work taking place in a kind of unregulated way outside the legislation still appears to be there for some local authorities. So that's another issue we need to continue to monitor. Um, so, but I think we have to say it's been, a, it's been a good start. So there has been lots of good practice, been some really innovative stuff over prevention work as well, good use of, of uh, spend to save money, some really good stuff there, which I won't go into too much now. Good examples of collaboration. Again, sorry, all right, yes, I'm getting a signal. Um, uh, some of the old habits still there, new law, old, some of that old gatekeeping stuff is still there. You know, People are being assessed at too early a stage about whether they're intentionally homeless, whereas actually it doesn't come to much later. That will go. As, as the local authorities get used to it, as the training intensifies, as Shelter Cymru gets in there and trains them properly, um, we would expect those kind of things to go. Um, uh, and as I've said already, people are counting things quite differently. So there's an issue about getting the data collection right so we get a better understanding of what's going on. Um, but um, certainly uh, the report we produced, um, which actually we called, I actually should have said at the beginning, it's called a brand new start. Uh, I think we, it, it mainly is positive about the ways forward and recognizes that there's things that we need to do. Where do we go next? Um, well, I've already said about the failure demand issue. It's about how do we get prevention even further upstream so we are addressing the failures of other services that drive homelessness. That's a key one. A people's pr uh, 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 PI on prevention, absolutely essential if we're going to get a real qualitative understanding of how effective prevention is. And we still want to see a complete end of priority need and a complete end of the, of the poor laws 
when it comes to homelessness in the end and having a truly universal service. And I'm nearly there. Uh, a very quick question for you, really. How well is homelessness policy located in over overall housing uh, strategy and law? We got a bit worried when there was other bits of legislation flying around, particularly the Renting Homes Act, that somehow the, the homelessness was kind of forgotten about. And in fact, there were certain things that originally proposed in the, homeless, uh, the, the Renting Homes Act, for example, ending the six-month tenancy, which didn't seem to fit very well with the concept of discharging people in the private rented sector. So there, there's always an issue, I think, of how well we joined up, even in a small country like us. But just a bigger question, uh, given that the 77 Act was about linking housing and homelessness, I guess we've also got to be careful, and maybe it's more of a worry in England, that uh, somehow they get delinked. That somehow there's the idea that homelessness goes back to a separate little box there and it's an issue, um, you know, it's a behavioural issue, it's an issue which you end up putting people into temporary accommodation. And that, that very important link with bricks and mortar is lost. And the final one is what is definitely not joined up is where I think Wales wants to go in terms of housing and homelessness strategies and where the UK government is going in terms of welfare benefits and austerity. And I guess the question there is should we be looking at um, calling for a housing benefit, for example, to be devolved. You know, it's only, I think, when we have control of those things can we have a truly uh, a, a Welsh housing strategy because, as already been said, it's a key lever uh, to, an, uh, to how you actually develop your housing mm -hmm. strategy. Effectively, we can do all kinds of progressive housing and homes and strategies in Wales, but if the UK government keep cutting the welfare benefits uh, and keep driving this kind of particular <laughs> approach, they're effectively constantly pulling a rug from under our feet. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Thanks to, thanks to Kate and John. We have time for open discussions where when Pete, uh, Pete Mackey shares the final Q&A session. Uh, so we move, we move straight, straight on now to a European perspective on policy priorities uh, with uh, Mike Allen from uh, Focus Time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'm Mike Allen. I'm uh, the president of FIANSA, which is the European network of organizations working against homelessness. So it's sort of a, an umbrella organization covering all the countries in, in the European Union. Um, uh, and it's I'm the, the voluntary president is like a, a board, one person from each country. And I'm from Ireland and I'm at the moment, I'm the president of it. Where I work is in Focus Ireland in Dublin, which is one of the leading homeless organisations uh, in Ireland. And if you were watching the match, if you were watching the match, <laughs> yes, it was the Focus Ireland logo that was on the Irish rugby team. Uh, and the, if you're in the stadium, uh, there was a, a, a huge sort of branding saying the Irish uh, rugby team supporting Focus Ireland, tackling homelessness together, which we were very pleased and, and proud of. So I don't know if any of you saw that, but. And as I should also say, as an Irishman who was born in Swansea, um, it was a great result. It's the worst. <laughs> um, okay, I've also lost the top of these, so you can just uh, fascinate yourself. What I'm going to talk about uh, is three things. The background to homelessness in the European Union, current practices and debates in, in, in Europe, what's happening now, and then where we're going next on this. And I want to thank people for asking me to speak at this. I should have said that, first of all, to speak at the, the shelter event, 50 years, and, and, and your uh, Cardiff University event. Um, I do think it's slightly questionable whether to give people very nice wine and then have two very interesting but demanding speeches and then ask them to listen to something about Europe is always a bit of a, 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 a challenge. We'll try and keep it uh, interesting. Um, background to... to um, uh, a brief history of Europe, that says at the top, that's meant to be a joke. Um, the, the, it, it's very difficult to talk about homelessness in a European context because the European Union, from the very beginning, has no responsibility, no uh, um, competency around housing and homelessness. So it's not allowed to talk about housing and homelessness. Okay, And then if you think of the difficulty that there is in the British context, of deciding what is homelessness and the, legis the battles that went on to, to get that definition. Imagine the range of definitions across Europe which come from different legal backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, just different ways of thinking about this thing. And so you've got, you're, 
you know, in this discussion, you're essentially asking a, a, to discuss about a concept of which there is no common agreement. How is it progressed within a, organiza a political organization which has no responsibility for it? So that's actually what you've asked me to talk about. So let's see if we can make that a bit interesting. Um, but right from the beginning, right from the formation of the European Union and when Britain and Ireland became into Europe, they've got this whole question of, of social Europe and, and the commitment that it's not just a trading partnership, it's meant to be doing something for people. And very important in terms of a lot of work that was done again in Britain and Ireland was the poverty programme uh, from, the from the 80s, which funded a lot of work in, in both our, our countries and, and in other countries in Europe, in, in, in the smaller Europe, and began to develop some ideas about anti-poverty work and homelessness. And at that point, a number of networks emerged at a European level when you're much smaller Europe. Um, probably the largest of those being the European Anti-Poverty Network set up as an uh, initiative of the European Union to try and create this debate between Europe and people really in grassroots organizations the most marginalized. And Fianza emerges from that sort of discussion. Um, at that time, so it's, it, Fianza is 25 years old now, um, uh, emerges from that, but uniquely amongst all the other voluntary organization, umbrella organizations, it sets itself up to talk at a European level about something which Europe is forbidden from talking about, homelessness. And I think it's very interesting whether because of the quality of the people who did the work in Fianza, and I don't include myself in that, but the people before me, or whether it's actually easier to frame something when there's no legal framework at the European level. It has been one of the most successful organizations, I think, at a, uh, in terms of framing the, the a debate around uh, poverty issues. Um, one of the ways it did that is by having a wing uh, which was the observatory on, on, on homelessness, which is exactly what you were talking about, this link between academics and the practitioners. And the European Observatory was set up around the same time. Nicholas is here as the British, one of the British people who's on the, the observatory. And it's some of the leading researchers on homelessness who meet on a regular basis, produce a European Journal of Homelessness, uh, and constantly interact with um, the, the practitioners who are involved in, 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 in more grassroots organizations to try and understand what we're thinking of. And out of that came, I think, probably the most significant, still the most significant contribution of, of, of uh, Fianza, which is the ethos typology. It isn't the definition of homelessness, but it came from, I think, years and years, people talk about these debates where there was just rows at, the, at Fianza every meeting where somebody said, that's not homelessness at all. No, this is homelessness. Only somebody who's lying on the street is homeless. No, no, he's not homeless. Uh, somebody who's suffered some domestic, fleeing domestic violence, are they homeless? Huge rows of people walking out of the room and, and, and so on. And out of that came this typology, which says, this is typology. One is, is rooflessness, then there's, you know, there's rough sleeping, there's, there's people who are in shelters and so on. And that has created a framework which I think many of you might be familiar with in discussions about homelessness. It comes from that, used by many national governments as their way of describing or, or typifying, and is now used by the Global Institute of Homelessness, basically a, a framework like that, to try and have a way in which when we're talking about homelessness, we might disagree about its causes or its solutions or what it means, but at least when we're having that disagreement, we can at least know that we're disagreeing about something that we all know that we're talking about and disagreeing about. It's a huge contribution. The, um, one of the uh, uh, other difficulties uh, or developments which has difficulties, you start off with the, certainly when Britain and Ireland join the European Union, you start off with Western Europe and, and the Nordic countries. And there's enough differences between you know, Britain and Ireland over here and, and continental Europe and Western Europe and Scandinavian countries or Nordic countries to already have quite a lot of debate. But subsequently, you have the Mediterranean countries coming in and the former Central European countries coming in. All have completely different ways of thinking about homelessness. They're completely different welfare systems, housing systems, and conceptualizations of, of poverty. So it's a very complex uh, way in which to develop policy, both at the levels of what are you asking for and what is the, uh, how is it understood in terms of what's going to, going to be delivered. Um, so where we are, so now, in terms of the, the, the framework in which, which we're discussing homelessness, uh, the, the overall framework for progress or structure of understanding where all policy is going in Europe is Europe 2020. 
um, which explains the time frame where it's working from. And within that, that doesn't mention homelessness, and there's still no recognition of homelessness at that level of, of uh, framework of, of political debate in, in Europe. But within that, or part of the, the European 20, is what's called the poverty platform. And in the poverty platform, there are seven flagships, and one of those flagships is about homelessness and trying to reduce the number of you know, uh, the level of homelessness, trying to align the policies of uh, countries ar around homelessness. I'll come back back to that. That's the bit that also says that there's a European-wide commitment to reduce the number of people living in poverty by I mean, 20 million. Um, well, so those are significant progress in terms of getting that agreed at a European Union level to be delivered. It is no longer progressing, it's just on the process of being thrown out because of the current political debate in, in Europe. The second sort of, so that's the first framework, while well, it's very problematic because it's the, the, the poverty part of it is, is, is being abandoned, but it's, it's important to understand in terms of what, how, where we are talking, what the framework in which we're talking about homelessness at the European level. The second thing is this European Union semester process, which you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, it's generally not discussed, uh, even at, in Irish level, where there's a much more engagement in Europe. But on an annual basis, there's a cycle in which the, the European Union draws up a report on each member country in debate with the, the member state itself. Then that's published with recommendations. The government responds back to the European Union and they respond to that. And each year this cycle goes on um, with or without any sort of policy impact whatsoever. <laughs> um, in some countries, those countries which were under the, which went bankrupt and had to be bailed out, very impactful because the European Union can tell them what to do. In other countries, it's, it's much less impactful. It's much more about telling what people to adopt economic policies, and you might argue more neoliberal economic policies, and much less about trying to deal with the social consequences of that. But we try and engage in that process and try and uh, uh, try, try and influence it and try and pull it towards um, uh, better discussion and awareness of, of, of social issues. The key, I think, one of the things that emerged from the social investment package and a lot of the European discussion um, is picking up what progressive or countries that were seen to be doing useful things were doing. Like from Suzanne's presentation this morning, I was reminded of the, the extent to which um, uh, Great Britain, United Kingdom, has adopted strategies or lost for, for local governments to adopt strategies to deal with homelessness. And a number of countries over a number of years started to do that. So one of the things that Fianza did was pick up that and saying, that seems to be a good idea. Ireland has done a prevention of homelessness strategy. Let's promote the idea that that's good practice to get everybody to do that. And then that turns up in the European Union, picked that up right up to the highest level, and they recommended that each country should adopt long-term housing-led integrated homeless strategies at national, regional, and local level. So all that sort of language is really positive. So it's a typical sort of European Union policy statement that we would be proud of of achieving at Fianza, have managed to get this into a high level document, get all the right words there, and then typically it probably has no impact whatsoever, or it's very hard to see exactly where it actually has traction, and that's one of the frustrations of working at that level. These are quotes here from it, to adopt a long-term housing-led integrated homeless strategy, and secondly, to introduce efficient policies to prevent evictions. Those are actual things that European Union asked every member state to do. And then it described what they thought should be an effective homeless strategies, prevention and early intervention, quality homelessness service delivery, rapid rehousing, systematic data collection, monitoring and using of shared definition, and the mention of details. Those are all things which everybody, you know, practitioners and academics looking at this area, um, uh, would believe are the sorts of things that are useful to work. So to get those into that high level uh, uh, policy statement at the European level was extremely important. So it's a source of great frustration that that social investment package now looks like on the point of being thrown out. So these are some of the strategies from around Europe. The front, front covers, spot your own, I don't see one in Welsh. But uh, there's one from Northern Ireland, there's the Irish one on prevention and the French one and so on. I think the, the, the Spanish have just adopted 
uh, just published their, their, their latest, and there's a debate going on in Portugal at the moment as well about, about their strategy, and Fianza is being asked to write a letter to the Portuguese government, to support a letter from the Portuguese homeless organizations about, about their strategy. So there's a lot of those around. That's a map which shows the adoption of the strategies adoption of the strategies uh, across Europe. So um, in the, the orange countries, it turned out orange, that's Northern Ireland is orange. Um, uh, the, uh, are the countries which have national level integrated strategies. So you, as you can see, very popular in Nordic countries, uh, Great Britain has one, Ireland has one, France, Portugal, Spain is, hasn't been orange in yet, but they, Greece has one, and then regional strategies are the white countries in here, Germany, and uh, um, uh, and then at the bottom you have the ones where there are integrated strategies not adopted. So the the it is the Eastern European countries and some of the Mediterranean countries, with the exception of Greece, you haven't had the adoption of these. So most of those countries, the homeless organisations, would be saying, you know, this is this would be a real important way forward, and lobbying their government to to achieve that. In most of the countries where you have one, the organizations are saying it's just not good enough uh, and trying to push it forward. But it creates at least a framework, believed to be a framework, in which uh, you can actually have a debate. Like it, it, obviously, in, it, as you're describing things in Wales, having a, a Welsh assembly and so on has created the context to have somebody to talk to. And if, in some countries where the government won't talk to the voluntary sector, having a, a, a strategy can be an important way of creating a, a space for that debate to actually take place. And this is the one where um, it mentions in the earlier one housing-led policies. And, and housing-led is a terminology which I think is largely emerged from Fianza sort of discussion, taking the housing first model which initiated New York, but which housing first properly understood, I think, or narrowly understood at least, um, is about rough sleeping and chronic rough sleeping and moving people forward with very high levels of support to, to independent living. But housing led is a sort of a way of describing policies which are based on the same notion that, people, that uh, uh, a home is, is where people will resolve their, the problems that led to their homelessness, um, but may need much less levels of support. So it doesn't, housing led doesn't necessarily imply the same levels of support as, as housing first policies, but but names the fact that, that while there are many routes into homelessness and many supports out of it, there is no route out of homelessness that does not involve having a home. Uh, every route out of homelessness involves that, and that's where the housing-led idea comes from. So that, again, that's a key political push that, um, that Fianza has been coordinating and working with, with, with organizations to support that notion. And this map gives you the ones where the blue countries, oh, okay, it's purple countries, uh, where your housing led with support is the dominant model, housing led strategy is adopted but not an operational reality, uh, such as Ireland. Supported housing is widespread, but the staircase model remains. Discuss uh, the United Kingdom uh, is, is analyzed as coming from that, and housing led strategy is not widely adopted, which is most of Europe. So, okay, most of Europe you're seeing that you still have very traditional ways of looking at homelessness. Um, seeing it as a, either a, a cultural problem or something which is the result of uh, people's individual uh, problems. Um, so the, the sort of challenges there are, where we're dealing with now at the European level, uh, just to name some of them, the refugee crisis is not just a humanitarian crisis for, uh, for the people involved, and it's not just a political crisis at the European level. It is, for many homeless organizations, an immediate problem for them. Um, in the French, French homeless organizations, which are substantial uh, institutions in France, have a legal responsibility for housing refugees. It's their, it falls to them, now with support from the French government, but it falls to them. In many other countries, what you have is when people arrive as refugees, there is a refugee institution to deal with them while they're refugees. But once they're refugees, then once they're allowed to stay in the country, they immediately fall on the, the, uh, the homeless system. And, the, and a lot of the European countries, uh, in, in Italy and, and, and in Germany and so on, overwhelming majority of the people that they're dealing with who are homeless are non-nationals from their own country. And are, 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 so it's, like it's, 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 uh, um, 
in Britain and Ireland it's different because we are more removed from that for a variety of reasons, but it's a really huge challenge um, for a lot of the homeless organizations across Europe. The second challenge I've identified is the future of social Europe. You can almost call it the future of Europe, and you're gonna have that debate here uh, as where you belong in that. But, to, but it is important to state that the way in which the United Kingdom has raised a challenge to Europe is one of the reasons why social Europe is under threat. Like, essentially the political message coming from the United Kingdom is we want to make, if, we want, if, if you want us to stay, you have to make Europe less social. Um, and that has created a lot, it's not the only country saying that, but it's probably the most vociferous. And that's one of the reasons why some of the progress around the, uh, the social impact package and so on uh, has, been, is, has been stepped back, been lost, is because of the debate um, about a Europe which is less social as part of the, the uh, possible exit of, of the United Kingdom. So in, in Europe there's a balance, in what we do, there's a balance of being just getting money from Europe uh, there's a, or is one of the options, or one of the ways you can just work and see Europe as a way where you might get some money to do stuff. You can see it as a way of co coordinating and regulating stuff, and you can see it as a way of sharing best practice. And this is the last slide. Under the funding, there's two quite interesting funds in, in process. One is this feed thing. It must have taken years to get a it's an English sounding pun because that's the food program for people who are um, uh, more or less destitute. It follows the, the it used to get money from the, the wine, cheese from the cheese mountain and wine from the wine lake and stuff. It's essentially that program uh, restruck against 3.5 billion over seven years. I'm not sure how it's operating in the United Kingdom. In Ireland, it's being used partly to fund homeless provision and partly to provide starter packs for people moving out of homelessness. And Easy is a fund also from that, that thing, which is possibly usable for, for homeless services. In the area of possible areas where we could work in terms of coordination and regulation, it's important to note that one of those things I said earlier that the European Union is thinking about is introducing European-wide regulation service standards for homeless services. And depending where you sit on that, that's a great idea. Um, because you might be wanting to improve the services in your area, or it's a bad idea because you think they'll show, show lower standards than you've already managed to achieve in your area, or it's a bad idea because you don't think Europeans should be telling you what to do. So, but that is possibly a, a major issue, and it possibly leads into international tendering on homeless services, um, which is a, a concern. The second coordinating area is this argument that Fianza is making that there should be a European-wide strategy on homelessness, which is a key demand the organization will be making over a period of time. And then there is likely to be, instead of the, the poverty framework, which so much work went into, which it looks like going, there is going to be a social rights pillar, and that that's a European debate at the moment, is whether that will actually include any social rights or not. And that's uh, 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 whether it just be about the workplace or include the things we're working at. And then the three remaining things just to name are, which is working at the European level, the European Union has adopted as a union the Convention of Rights of People with Disabilities since so many people who experience homelessness have mental health disabilities. There are possibilities at the European level of trying to use some of the leverage that that gives us to try and, and, and yeah, assistance for them. There is a big debate about how we adopt the housing first idea to the European context and the particular housing issues that are there. And then finally, and most probably most importantly, is the fact that voluntary organizations working on this issue of homelessness can learn a lot from each other, even if they're working in very different contexts through working in Fianza or working collaboratively with that. British organizations for very complex historical reasons often don't engage in that, that level. Um, shelter have and crisis have and so at different sort of stages. But the engagement is much less so than there in any other European countries. And I think that that has been to the loss of other European countries and probably to the loss of, the, of, 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 of British countries. And it's something that British organizations, and I think that it's something that, that um, uh, we, can, we can invest in and we can probably gain a lot from. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, that sets it, Ian up very nicely to talk about some international perspectives on, on, on policy and then we conclude with an open session <coughs> chaired by Pete on, uh, 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 to discuss questions and answers. Ian, thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, <coughs> thanks for that, Mike. If it was a challenge to move from, uh, uh, from 
England and Wales to Europe, there is an even bigger challenge to move from there to, to a global perspective on this. Before I do, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to go a little bit off piece because um, I, I found it an incredibly uh, 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 informative day. And I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments before I get into the uh, in, in, international uh, stuff. The first is, um, I really appreciate what Shelter has been saying all day about um, uh, not wanting to celebrate 50 years. Um, but I think we should allow ourselves the opportunity uh, to congratulate Shelter for what they've done over, over, over the last uh, 50 years. Um, and I say that as someone who didn't grow up with Shelter during the, the Gabby men phase. Um, I grew up during the Gabby woman phase, right? Um, I was brought up in the days of um, Sheila McKechnie and, and Louise Casey, and they were gobby, and they were the people who kind of got me on, on my way in, into homelessness. It was a bit kind of tempered by Chris Holmes after that, but don't, that's, that's where, 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 where I, I come from uh, on this. And uh, when I was listening to Suzanne earlier on going through that wonderful summary of 50 years of homelessness, it was like a complete flashback for me, right? Um, and I um, came into homelessness in the early 80s when I started working um, at Centrepoint um, and did uh, 14 years at Centrepoint before I was uh, appointed as uh, the then government advisor to the Blair government um, in 1997. And on homelessness um, and went through that wonderful period where we established the Rough Sleepers Unit, we did the homelessness directory, we slashed uh, uh, temporary accommodation, we slashed families in bed and breakfast um, and it was a tremendous period to be there through, ending up in the Troubled Families uh, programme at the end. Which I, uh, uh, um, but the reason I make that point is, when I hear, Kate, and please, this is not a criticism, it's an observation, when I hear you describe ministers being quite benign in the future about the approach they're going to take to homelessness, you know, and I say this with the freedom now of somebody who's left DCLG and can stand here in the voluntary sector again and say, don't believe it, right? This is when we need shelter to be strong again, right? Um, I stood in, uh, Eli in, it's now in Marsham Street, a student DCLG, challenging a special advisor, not a minister, but a special advisor, and I said, what is all this about selling off uh, RSL flats and, and council housing? And he pointed over to the Peabody estate across the road from me, and he said, why should they be able to afford to live there when I can't? That's what, that's what motivates them, yeah? And when I said to them, uh, uh, um, why on earth do you not realise the impact you're going to have with all these benefit changes on all these homeless people that are stuck in these hostels? And you can point to them around the south end of uh, Westminster. Um, and they said they don't care, right? These people cost the state of fortune and they're skivers, right? They're a waste of, they're a waste, they're a waste of public money, right? So I didn't stand up to say that. Right, but I was kind of inspired <laughs> by, by Sheila McKechnie. Okay, how do you move from that to international homelessness? And um, look, just very quickly, because I'm conscious of the time. I've now joined this new organisation, uh, uh, DePaul. Uh, DePaul International is the bit of it uh, that I head up, um, and um, I really just wanted to um, just say, I think the key question. And that the Paul International and through the uh, Institute of Global Homelessness, which I'll explain where that fits in in a minute, is trying to address is um, why is it in the world we can count the number of birds there are, yeah, but yet we don't know how many homeless people there are, right? Um, or perhaps more pertinently, how come we can have global campaigns around malaria, poverty, HIV, and yet we've never really been able to articulate that agenda? on a global scale around housing and homelessness. So if you're going to set yourself a challenge, set yourself a big challenge. Um, so the, our journey to that for the Paul, that's my name. That's very good. That's my title. I didn't realise that was coming. Um, so my, my, my journey into this to try and explain where we're going with this is through the development of the Paul International as an organisation uh, and, and, and how we've come about. So DePaul was set up originally in London, uh, again, 1989, for those of you who remember it, around in those days, Calvin Hume, really concerned about the number of young people hanging around uh, Victoria, the particular that area of, uh, of, of London, terrible benefit changes get on, uh, oh, terrible time. But anyway, set up as a, as a direct response to uh, people on, on the street. Then, after it got established in London, decided to expand beyond London and move to five uh, different cities um, across England, right? 
Then, because of its very strong base through the Pollen Island, moved over to Ireland, started to develop homelessness services um, across Ireland, both north um, and south, working alongside the Simon community um, and, 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 and others there. Um, then, with, as the, with the accession states uh, coming into uh, uh, the EU, we were approached to, uh, uh, to, to work in uh, Slovakia, originally in, in uh, Bratislava. Um, and that was a different kind of response to what we were doing in, in the UK, what we were doing uh, in, 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 in Ireland. Completely different response. You know, huge big hostels just to open to keep people alive, really, was what that was about. Um, and then through that, uh, uh, we then got invited to go and uh, do some work in, uh, in Ukraine. So when I was out with uh, the, the European uh, Union uh, uh, completely, uh, so again, we're building up this huge big uh, experience uh, in different countries. Then we get challenged to go and develop services in America. And we now work across six different states uh, in America. We've always had the base in France because it's DePaul and that's where DePaul uh, uh, came from. So we suddenly found ourselves in this situation where we had, we were operating in six different countries, running services from the UK, which is about homelessness prevention, night stops, social impact bonds, quite sophisticated. And over in uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, we're literally getting soot out to Kharkiv because there's so many people being displaced from the war area just to keep them alive. And in Slovakia, we were opening 200 bed shelters because 36 people died in, in the cold uh, uh, last year. So you know, we're basically a service delivery organization. The biggest challenge we then got was when we went to, when we went to America. Because when we, uh, DePaul is closely tied uh, to Chicago University, the biggest university uh, in, 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 uh, in Chicago. Um, and I love working with Americans, they were absolutely great. They said, okay, well, let's, why are you, Ryan, just pick this off individually across countries. Our challenge to you is to try and develop a global approach to this, uh, building on your, your, your experience. And through that, they helped us in partnership set up the Institute of, 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 of Global Homelessness. Um, and their challenge to us was threefold. It said, well, first of all, why is there no global voice on homelessness? That there's voices, of which Fianza would put right in there at regional level, there's regional voices, why aren't there international uh, voices, yeah? Two, why aren't there no definitions of homelessness? Okay, so you, so you counted rough sleepers in, across the whole of England, you know, you counted rough sleepers across Manhattan, you did all that kind of stuff, no, but there's no, there's nothing coming out of this by way of a definition. So we went back and we looked at what Fiancé were doing. We went back and looked at what uh, uh, people were doing in America and in Canada. And with Fiancé and others, we started to build up that idea of a typology that you can uh, then start to use in different uh, parts of the world. Um, and then the third challenge was how do you build up, how are you going to build up the capacity and capability, both locally regionally and globally to take on take on this program. As I say, the Americans think big. Um, and out of that came the Institute uh, for Global Homelessness, which I'm kind of here today to describe, and I want you all to get involved in it if, 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 if you can, um, because we do think it's a, an emerging uh, a global movement. Four strands uh, of, of work to it. So the first strand is actually bringing people together from different uh, parts of the world to look at uh, what solutions uh, uh, people are developing in their country. We, we can't believe the amount of countries from uh, Brazil to India, Mexico, wherever, across South Africa, who are now coming towards us to try and say, well, we need to talk about this. We need to share the type of things uh, we are doing. We need to build the infrastructure behind this. So yes, we're working on the typology. We're now testing that out in different parts of Europe, in different uh, uh, parts of the world. We're developing a leadership program. Again, there's good local and regional leadership programs, but we're trying to find a new leaders to come through uh, and drive uh, this agenda forward um, at a global level. And then the final one is um, around profile and momentum, uh, because we don't understand why homelessness and need for housing hasn't had the same profile, as I said at the beginning, around things like hunger, poverty, health issues. We don't know why the, the previous uh, lobby done under Habitat 2 wasn't successful. We don't know why the UN uh, haven't taken this up. Uh, but by God, we're going to give it a go. Um, and we think the key to it is coming right back to shelter back here 
I think it's about being a bit angry about it again. Um, what strikes me coming back into the voluntary sector, both here, but also when I go to the, the countries abroad, is people aren't angry about this anymore. So the challenge to yourself is, let's take this on at a global level, let's get angry about it again. Thank you very much. Super. Right, Kevin, much appreciated. Thank you for being the voice of the school. Um, he sounded far more authority than me. Um, so we're going to we're going to have a, a good bit of time for questions, um, at least half an hour. Can I ask our speakers um, from this evening to come and take a, a seat on the, the chairs over there? And I, I'm literally just going to going to fire up, take questions. Most of us seem to be over this side. The people want to kind of shuffle over and we'll just hold this button and sit over on the side. John had a catch of John had a catch of I'm also going to invite Susanna. I, I told her I was going to get her back, so using her all the time this morning. This afternoon. Plus, we unfortunately, we unfortunately didn't have um, Adam from Shelter Scotland. So, if you've got any Scottish questions, uh, feel free to. <laughs> 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 there's, a, there's another Scottish accent on the. Uh, uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, any questions? Who wants to start us off? Hi, um, I'm Angela Caspel and I'm the Chief Executive of the Community Housing Association in um, somewhere in Somerset. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the decoupling of homelessness from um, the great, the, the sort of more strategic housing car crash that we've got um, the um, sort of played out at the moment. Um, I think. The question, I think John posed that question, and I think my feeling is that it, ha it is being decoupled. In fact, it has been decoupled. I completely agree that the British government is entirely um, not benign. What's the word? They hate housing. Benign. <laughs> they hate housing. They certainly hate housing. They hate people. <laughs> they hate people. Yeah. Poor people. Um, but so I, I, the whole focus is on um, home ownership um, going forward, um, and that is kind of creating, I think, a massively, um, a really awful cultural shift within the housing association movement, which I, well, I'm calling it a movement, perhaps that's a bit overblown, but I, it's creating, I think, a massive cultural shift. So I'm going to. Um, or uh, meetings at the moment with local authority partners and other people from housing associations where we are not, where housing associations are safe, they are not housing uh, people um, who have low incomes, they are not housing vulnerable people, they are not housing homeless people. And um, yes, I am really angry about it. Um, I think that um, the the commercialisation of housing associations is gaining momentum and there is there is a part of the housing association movement that is working against that but it just needs to keep that momentum that is anti the commercialisation of housing associations going. So I think John also talked about the systemic approach and I think it is really important not I think it is really important to talk about homelessness as a product of a massive systemic car crash. I mean, I can't really think of another word for it at the moment. Um, I don't know if that is useful, but I guess what I'm trying to say is there are people in housing associations who are trying to fight against that. Um, I, I think the ways for people at a local level to come together who are bothered about it and come together at a local level, but I think maybe the, I had a, I am now beginning to think that maybe there also needs to be links going out from that to 
to a more regional and a national and maybe an international level. Does that sound at all? Useful, or I just off. <laughs> I it's a useful reflection that yeah, there was a bit of babbling under, but there was a, a really, um, a, a, a really, um, a really important reflection. It's late in the evening, yeah. That's, that's, that's about. I mean, then, if anybody wants to respond, um, uh, great. But I think it's a really, um, a really useful observation. Uh, and absolutely right. Uh, uh, other questions, observations from, from others? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, um, Tim Brown, Democratic University, um, worked with Angela before, all <laughs> sorts of projects. Uh, uh, living as I do in the middle, what strikes me very noticeably is the way that there are real tensions among housing associations and local authorities about whether what uh, what is their role you know it's getting back to the question are they part of the solution or part of the problem and i think it's different depending on the culture of local authorities uh, where i live in coventry there's always has been there's been a culture in the city for many years to help uh, migrants from abroad going right back to chilean refugees in the early 1970s, and that's created a real passion of support at one level. But if you go into some of the other cities in the Midlands, it's very different. So you have to work with what you've got. Yeah, good. Any other observations, comments, Anna? I'm Anna Clark, Cambridge Centre of Housing and Housing Research. A question really for, for Ian about this international definition. And I just wondered whether you thought it is helpful to have international definitions from the point of view of a country like Britain that's relatively wealthy, or whether, you know, how do we manage that where there must be countries where, say, 90% of people are living below a standard that we would deem to be acceptable accommodation. And if we're trying to, to improve standards in our own country and to say this isn't acceptable in a wealthy country like Britain, how does that fit with a global perspective where you've had to draw the bar quite low to avoid categorising almost the entire country as being homeless? Uh, I'm sure I want to answer your question. Yes, to both of you. It's one of these things, it's almost like too big, why even start? <laughs> uh, it is a challenge. There's been huge big debates already. In IGH, uh, whatever about, about this, and, uh, um, you know, it's how on earth do you compare, um, I don't know, rough sleeping in uh, London with a shanty town in Kalisha in, in South Africa, never mind, you know, the, 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 the shanty town in Bombay, you know, the, and, and that other is it's almost like too big to start thinking about. But, but there's a view the other way around, which unless we do start to grapple with this, then we won't be able to articulate it beyond a local or, or a national problem. So I'm kind of on, on, on that side of the argument. The approach that's been taken, and I'm not on the academic side of this, I'm, I'm a practitioner on this, is to kind of rather than try and bash out some definition that we can apply across the world, is to break it down into typology. So if, if, if the problem in your country at this time is, you know, people sleep rough, can we agree that? If it's about temporary homes, can you build up from that? If you're in Bombay, what does it mean there? What's the typology? How can you apply it there? But, um, although it's been quite interesting, thing. we've been worried a couple of gatherings, I think we call it, bringing some sort of people together uh, uh, from different parts. It's amazing how much you can apply across, across international boundaries from what I can see. Mm -hmm. Can I maybe comment on that? Because um, I was involved with um, Bill, actually, it's made said we built them on the work for ESOS work very much and um, in developing the IGH typology of the dense community work and restriction on this research site, we, we developed it. And exactly the reason you say, I mean, we're very explicit that it's not a definition of home, this is what it is as a typology. So it explicitly sets out to provide, as many of the same ethos as was done, I think, in your work, it's a single based contribution actually that the observers that, that, made a lot of contribution, but I think it's a single most important one. Um, it's just to give a, a basic um, frame, a framework within which you can have a conversation so we can each know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's very um, explicit in the paper that we've done by IGH and now um, uh, and the publication in the journal to say that this isn't a definition because it wouldn't make sense for reasons that you say to say this is how homeless should be defined in every country in the world or something explicitly taken against that, but said that there's 
there is scope to have, like he thought, to have um, a, a, a reference frame, and that's what it is, so is that when you're talking about different aspects of what might complement in some countries but not in others, you can at least agree what it is we're talking about. What we've also said about the IGH, um, particularly useful part, is that within this typology, which goes from not just sleeping rough in the same way, but also things that people living in, um, you know, some of the things we've seen in the photographs of people living in various forms of transport on railway lines and all that and stuff, um, is that those are the areas, the more extreme areas of this typology, is what IGH's work should focus on in the type of multi campaign, which is the same as saying. That's a global definition of homelessness, but out of all of these things that one might describe as homelessness, mm -hmm. here's the bit that makes no sense for IGH to focus on. Not least because there's plenty of other organisations already um, focused on the issues around sports resettlement and, and so on. So I think this, this I know it sounds like a bit of a, it, it sounds a bit of a sort of fine distinction between typology and definition, but actually it's quite an important one, it's not a definition of so, so. Yeah, I, I was going to, I, I agree with that entirely, and I, I think it was the danger of the typology it ends up, when I first was engaged with that sort of thing, coming across ethos, it sounds a bit sort of too out there, yeah. it's just so we hear, and this like kind of guy. But I, I found it an extremely useful practical tool in terms of moving from a row about what, well, you know, what are we talking about, and people are very angry and heated views of what they think it is, but it allows them to back up those other discussions. What personally I don't think is useful, right, is when I was at the, I was uh, invited, uh, that night to be invited to the, uh, the, uh, what's it, the Global um, mm -hmm. Institute uh, event in Chicago last year, which was fascinating and it was really interesting to see the wide range of things. But the number of the people there are really absorbed with this idea of let's count them. And I absolutely agree, and so Peter does, and will present this afternoon, at your local level where you have, a, a, you have administrative units which, and political units who are trying to deal with them, you've got to count them, you've got to know what you've got to follow it through. Counting them on a global level is just, if you've been absorbed it for years, you argue over years, and nobody gives a damn whether it's one million or ten million or a hundred million. Because it doesn't matter whether it's ten, we all agree it doesn't matter, whether it's one million, ten million, or hundred million, it's too many, many people. So to define exactly how many too many it is, is problematic. Um, so I think a huge amount of energy could be absorbed in, in rounds on that, yeah. which would be better spent elsewhere. I completely yeah. agree, and I, I do think that maybe the challenge should be forwarded to, particularly in the, in the sort of Western European context, is to, is to bring that kind of usefulness to it. How, how does this become a useful because I think you're completely right that actually the place to start is probably the more kind of extreme end of the spectrum. Um, because having, having a bit of background in the child poverty sector, those arguments around relativity um, are incredibly unrecoverable. You know, if you look at where we are now with the of child poverty, um, the government appoints to completely scrap the concept of relative income, which they have found very easy to do because people have this common sense place that they go to around well, how can we have poverty and question as that if they might have to look at that. Yeah. I, I don't see it, but you can see the healthy baby moment. <laughs> because uh, I, in accounts to that, I lived through that period where um, you know, I started seeing it throughout the, uh, the definitions and the way to count rough sleepers in the UK. Um, and up until that point, um, the big numbers it got in the way. So people say, oh, there's 600,000 people with homeless, there's, 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 you know, people just couldn't really get. And the more there was a, a, a fudge about the numbers, the easier it was for policymakers to get, get off the hook. Mm -hmm. right? And the game changer was when you sat in a room with ministers and said, look, minister, you know, we don't care whether people see this quarter of a million homeless people in the UK or five million or whatever. We know in this that night in England, well actually it was London initially, there's eighteen hundred people, right? So and it's manageable, right? And then you could suddenly turn it around to get a well, look, you know, don't use your big numbers, the back of black numbers, to stop action. So so that, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle. I think, I think that's just the numbers that help. 
you can do it. You can do it. Making into discrete number number and presenting it to someone who can argue have a direct responsibility, yeah. and the risk is it goes the other way. It's a huge number, yeah. and it's just diffuse accountability. But I, I think the point didn't actually disagree with me. I was just saying like this idea, and, and it wasn't the people from the global Institute were arguing it, but certain people. And it's, and it's only criticisms for being the first thing they thought of. Yeah. It's just you need to move on from it. Let's have a global number. How many people are homeless in the world? But it's a different point to say. Let's resource the if they need it, because they don't presume they don't they do need it, let's resource a new homeless organization that may be setting up in some uh developing country that hasn't got the methodology of counting, so that they can go to their government and go through that process. Because I think that's the most interesting thing about international work is sort of a Marxist question as to whether every country has to go through the same process of development to reach where it is, or whether by learning from other countries, you can skip some of the processes yeah. and fast forward and not build the 200 bed. Because that must be a huge issue as well. You're building 200 bed units in Bratislava when you know that the future of human homelessness in, in the States is closing 200 bed units. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, and that, that must be a, a, an enormous, I'm not saying you're wrong in doing that, but I imagine it's a really deep it discussion. Is yeah. It yeah. is the challenge if you've articulated it very well. Like some have to, some have to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> and then some say, what, what's the quality standards for there? <laughs> so no, you, you, you're dead yeah, right, but yeah, but um, and you have to keep coming back to you know, what is it about it. Right is how it is because you know, the year before last, 36 people died in the coldest winter, there's yeah. nothing, if you get something, you get this. I mean, that's a quality project, yeah. because that's what you need at that time. I wouldn't want to go back to the days of Roman hostels in London. Yeah. Okay. God forbid that my DSS be selling units, right? You know, that would be that would be a step back the way, right? So uh, but then it's one of the challenges is yeah. looking at across international boundaries. Um, and I agree with you it's not a straight line. Yeah. Because the fact a lot to be learned in these Eastern European countries about the the long set of very flexible and responsible business. Whereas over here, so they come back to your point. Some of the other ISLs used to be the most responsive to homelessness, right? When I came into this game, it was ISLs that were the cutting edge of tackling homelessness, so they've gone that way. Right? So maybe they need to be filled with this way. Brilliant. That's it. We just give them one question, don't we? And then they go. <laughs> <laughs> this is an easy job. We had two questions. We had one here and then one there. So if your question is still. It is. I've got something else to add to it. My name is Anne Fallingsborough, I'm chair of the YMCA Housing Association here in Cardiff. We run the largest homeless hostel in Wales. Um, first thing I'll pick up on, just because you're, you're talking about, is the size of units. Like we've got 120 beds all together, but they're not really in one building. Like I don't see anything wrong with large units. Everyone's quite happy to stay in a 200 bed hotel. And the reason if I have to stay in a 200 bed hotel is they don't think they're going to live there forever. I spent quite a long time working with people with learning disabilities, and there, you know, we had a very strong movement of trying to drive units, shut the big hospitals, as they, they, they were hospitals, they were dumps really, what they call them hospitals, shut the big ones, get people into small units, because that's the natural way to do it. And clearly the end result for people that are coming through the homelessness system is to get them into small units where they can live a normal life. But if they're passing through the big hospitals fast enough, they don't see any surprise. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that strikes me is we haven't really talked about some of the underlying problems and causes of homelessness. And it seems to me that there's essentially three um, major sort of streams that run through it. First one is, is traumatized people. So you've got people like ex service people who are grossly overrepresented in the homelessness section. You've got people with mental health difficulties, drug use, etc. Refugees fleeing the war. So but one of the first things we've got to do to tackle that problem. Because we've actually got to sort the world. We've got to make the world a better place to live, and we want less traumatized people coming through. The second thing we've got is huge economic problems. When I left school, there was a quarter million people in the UK unemployed. And when that poster was produced, it said Labour's not working, there were 600,000 people. And now we're learning to live with three and a half million. And we think that's somehow like it's okay. And people even talk about now, if we get it down to two and a half million, we'll, we'll go back to the they got full employment. That's not fully important. So we've got a number of people who are falling into homelessness simply because they don't have jobs and the benefit system is crap. And then the third underlying problem that we're not addressing 
is, is what Mark Twain said. And he said, um, I land my son because they don't make it. And it's, it's the rising price, not so much of houses, because you can still get a brand new four bed house with a double garage, central heating, whatever, whatever, for about £100,000. What you can't get is a patch of land to sit it, because that's just the house. Housing in real terms now costs less to build than it's done at any point in our history. But land is completely uncontrolled and is a ridiculous cost. It was in 1964 that Harold Wilson and Tony Benn got together this idea of nationalising land with housing consents in the, in the city areas in order to control the prices. And unfortunately, they weren't brave enough to do it. And I don't know whether um, you know, Harold Wilson was always petrified that MI5 was going to kill him. I think they might well have killed him. Yeah. <laughs> such a huge amount of money being made out of that. We have to get away from this idea that somehow the market is going to sort anything. Because the market works as a perfect mechanism. It's supply and demand. I mean, keep the demand. You know, the cartels that own our land keep the, keep the demand, keep the supply low, so the demand goes up and up goes the price. We've got to take land out of that. We've got small movements like the community land trust movement that's trying to do that. But we've got to have an absolutely massive attack on the price mm -hmm. of land. And until we tackle those three issues, all we're going to do is, you know, in academic research, we just work out what's going on. And, and, you know, I'm in the, I'm in the angry group. You know, I don't want to work out what's going on. I'm going to put the fix it. Does anybody want to respond? It's, it's not so much a response, but uh, uh, I haven't really talked about Ireland, but um, it, in Ireland, um, that has not been a, uh, a problem of family homelessness, like people like describe in, in, in Dublin, in, in, in London. And certainly, there'd be no, and I think this is true in, in Britain, there'd be no possibility of a, of a family with children who are sleeping. If you go to Paris, you see families bedding down by the side of the road in tents. And that goes back to part of your point you made about unemployment and so on. But society of a certain sort of things that they think is absolutely outrageous and we're not going to put up with it. And that shifts over time. And one of the things that we are really concerned about in, in Ireland is making sure that it continues to be outrageous that a hundred families became that one was a month. And that relates to this international thing as well, in the the Indian uh, I mean, the economist and political thinker, Amrita Sen, said that has up, had made the case that no famine has ever occurred in a democratic country because the forces that within the democracy won't allow it to happen. Right? Famines happen not because of shortage of food, but distribution. But the next layer of human need down from famine is homelessness. And yet democratic society seems to be able to, to absorb enormous amounts of the United States America, enormous amounts of homelessness. So that fascinates me as to what it is that makes it just socially unacceptable. Certain forms of homelessness are socially unacceptable and then that shifts. And that's the bit I think we need to get. It is about getting angry, and it's, but it's about knowing how things work. And it's about knowing where that anger in society is. It's not about me getting angry, it's about me making the rest of society angry that the, the I job. Think, I think that's a really key point because Shelter gets a lot of flack at the moment for not being angry enough. Um, and I think the frustrating thing from my point of view is the government think that we're crazy. They think that we're screaming up and down all the time. But people agree with us, we just look like we're going with them. Um, and, and there is, it, it is that recognition of where are the mass of the people? Because on, on welfare reform, George Osborne is completely right that the majority of public opinion is with him up to a point. It will it will shift if the kind of very visible effects reach a certain level and become unacceptable. But he's not wrong to think he has permission to do this. And it's the awkward thing about your people, the example as well, where one of the most difficult debates is around kind of out of area in London and um and, you know, people's right to live in the city where they live. Um, and I'm very aware that that's a kind of, if that flares into a public debate, it's not one we're going to win. Um, so if we're talking about using anger as a tool, there is a discussion about how we use it constructively rather well, than just to make ourselves feel good. Um, because I'm interested in kind of what works, even if our benchmark for success over the next 10 years is going to be depressing the entire mitigation. 
I was going to rather get that than nothing but feel great about myself. Two good points. One is um, I absolutely agree you can run good large hostels. I was spent a few years we were some of the biggest boys we had in the world. It's not the size of the building, it takes quality in the prison. So anything I said, having said that, some of it I just felt that impression was coming. No, no, you will get it from me. You know, okay. uh, having said that, you know, when I worked in so two of the biggest resettlement units, DSS resettlement units, I would close them down tomorrow for that. Uh, that so you can really run really big. Bad. Doesn't, big doesn't mean good either. Big, big doesn't mean big doesn't mean bad. So uh, just to, 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 to clarify that. But, and yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you. I'm not into to get angry just for the sake of it. Uh, and I think there's something uh, about with this back to the UK now, you can know, about revisiting mm -hmm. that whole period, because uh, we're in a period of change again, which feels a bit like uh, uh, Early 80s, mm -hmm. uh, um, we are. We all have to face up that probably this government's going to be around for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and you know, I, I was around in '82, '83, when everybody, somebody said earlier, was waiting for the Labour government to come back, and they didn't for 18 years. And it just feels like we're maybe somewhere in there again, and we're going to have to find ways to channel our, our, our anger, mm -hmm. articulate a case, uh, um, deal with people that are in front of us. Yeah. So I'm not. Also deal with with it. I, I think yeah. it's, it's maybe yeah. less in the homelessness sector because um, there's still something quite vivid about the concept of homelessness, but certainly yeah. in the poverty sector, yeah. it, people have happily spoken about anti poverty campaigns for years and completely been happy to ignore the fact that to the public, to the people who are doing this the word poverty is meaningless. Mm -hmm. To people in poverty, it's meaningless. People don't self define as being in poverty. Yeah. So if we, if we want that kind of entities sort of recreation to go the right way, we have to find a smarter way to be, to be talking to people who are mistakenly our friends. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I generally am quite optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist uh, on, on this, and I do think you, you, you see over the years organisations like Shelter and Crisis and Centre Point, not necessarily that they set housing associations, but you do see campaigning organisations reinvent themselves at the right time, right place. So I'm, I'm not a pessimist on it. You know, but um, I'm, I'm struck putting back into the voluntary sector after 18 years of the statutory mm -hmm. side um, just about that lack of anger. And it wasn't directed to the show, not so just that lack of, um, and I don't actually, I mean it more from the organisations that I see in some of the big cities in the UK who are 98% government funded. Yeah. I, I, well, well, you know. yeah. It's good. It's good. Yeah. 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 Yeah, your question, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Elaine Moore. I was here working uh, on the part of Share Lives Plus, the plus part of which is a home share scheme which uh, operates um, in England but not yet in Wales. So I'm interested in exploring how we could get it going. But interestingly, uh, it's quite widely known and used in Europe. And so I'm interested in finding out why culturally, like commentary, things work in some places and yet not in others. So that's my question. My observation, going back to the point of why it matters at the global level, I was listening to Peter Peop this morning, the person who discovered the Ebola virus, um, but who's also done international work on HIV AIDS. And his comment was that it wasn't until the UN Security Council spoke about HIV AIDS that all the world leaders, in, including those countries where millions of people were infected with HIV, who had hitherto not even spoken about it, that it was only at that moment that everybody started to do something about it. So there is an argument to be made for getting top level bodies to start talking about the issue of homelessness and why it should be something that's spoken about at that level. Your hunger is the number one sort of thing. And then it's shelter, but we've just finished, it's not, um, it's just basically funded, it's not published yet. We've just done a study of destitution in the UK, 
And part of that study, which is also is for some of the comments that can just mean a bit public debate, part of that study was actually doing um, a survey of the UK public on the definition of the institution. And um, having been very depressed for a lot of the reasons we've been talking about around poverty and so on, is the findings of that, and actually this part of the study was published in an interim report, the findings of that were actually quite reassuring, albeit from a from a whole <laughs> from a whole threshold here, you know. Um, but in terms of the extent to which the public were willing to say that um, that people were destitute if they lacked it was if they lacked a number of sort of it was out of six essential so I won't see what they are. Um, but food and shelter were top of that was but there's a range of other things around these technologies and so on. And actually the, the, the public uh, were willing to endorse the definition of destitution that was much more generous than some of I have to say the key charities working in the public field. Mm -hmm. So I did wonder if you um and you know, I, I think we're all we're all struggling with the same issue at the moment, aren't we? We're working in a context where our values aren't the ones that are leading the political mm -hmm. debate and we're trying to work out ways to work with this one because I've been here for a while and try and make some progress whether it was more souls in the process and and uh, and it's a difficult one for everyone. But I was really quite reassured that actually there comes a point where public does push back and there's things that seem unacceptable. But the other part of it that we haven't published yet. Um, which is about um, the survey of people who are destitute using the definition of the public endorsed, so then we can come up to figure out how many people are destitute in the UK based on that figure. I won't tell you it yet, but it's quite a big number. Um, and we did um, a lot of different things with people experience in it. And what we found is that people actually try to fish out of food a lot of the time. People are much more willing to go without food to go without shelter. And that was something that some of the Key informant the sort of voluntary agencies that work across the child poverty action group and the migration charities as well as the mostly charities. A lot of them had actually said that the problem would be fixed, and indeed it is what we found. So, shelter and food are very kind of, they are the top ones, and then all the other things that we're asking about, about heating and lighting and, and so on. Lighting is always not heating, actually, which is not something I had to do, but then you can't sit in the dark, you can sit in a cold house, we're not a dark house. So, it kind of makes sense, and it's what the public said, it's what the we were experiencing it, but the, but but shelter and food were right at the top. But actually, shelter even more than food. So it just poses the question: of people are putting in an even more acute Why is it more difficult to get that purchase at global level on shelter than it is on food and in health? Given that actually, at least in the UK, people see it both for themselves but also for others. It's been, if anything, even higher. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a terrible. It's a terrible trade off to me, mm -hmm. but if you have to make it, people will go with it, but they don't keep it. Uh, we'll take another, maybe one or two questions. I haven't an answer yet. Okay, <laughs> 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 Besides that, shit. Yeah. I don't know about sheer lighting, and I don't know why it's not taken up in most uh, ways. Uh, um, but I do think uh, one of the things we're looking at in the issue of performances is that strand around how you shear things across very reasons in terms of what works. Uh, uh, so, for example, we, the fall in UK, run a night stop program where we encourage uh, uh, families to host somebody short term overnight. And uh, when I've taken out to Ireland, who are very keen to do it, uh, but the Americans don't seem to like it. So I don't know how sometimes these things translate, uh, and sometimes uh, 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 they don't. And on the United Nations one, well, yeah, I think it's a very active issue within the issue of global homes at the moment because there's, a, there's some people within the, in the global homes who see the response to homelessness as a bottom-up one, right? It's com community solutions, uh, uh, you know, kind of, and that's the way to build that up. There are other people who think it's talked about, actually, it's both. Uh, so my question is, well, why haven't we had, you know, you know why? So we've been we're doing things to try and get homelessness housing back on the habitat agenda. How do you get this thing up the UN agenda? So it's, the people start to think like that. You, you need to do more. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it touches the conversation we were having about um, sort of relative definitions I think we do just have to accept and find a way to work with that there are very different cultural expectations. You know, I find it very frustrating because some of our most successful media stories are about the proportion of young people living in their, with their parents still, um, which for some reason in the UK seems to really outrage people. But if you went to southern Europe, it was completely normal. Um, so there are just different expectations. And I think there's also a point about it's very hard. It's very hard for people to have that sense of going backwards, where you know, it might be that sort of housing in the 70s and 80s was a complete a historical blip. It, that, that might turn out to be the case, and the idea that people live independently at a relatively young age, home ownership is rising, that might 
video fiction. But now people have seen it, it's very hard to be persuading people to you know, throw up all the cultural baggage about paying guests being something to do with productive luck and ideas about shared accommodation. Um, to try and sell that to people is quite problematic. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but it means there is that basic in the cultural system. Did we get an answer to your question? Did we get an answer? Yeah, to a degree. Yeah. yeah. I think the, the UN Habitat agenda, I mean, there, there is a, a global agenda for UN Habitat. We're just a bit slow to inform it. So yeah. Habitat 3 is, is happening in Quito in, uh, in October, but the, it, it's written. And, and actually from experience and conversations, the sector has very little say, which ministers live around. And I think for us it's uh, Minister for the Environment that will get the say on housing. Uh, that's really, uh, so it's, it's a very difficult agenda to to inform. Um, I mean, the IGH has made an attempt yeah, um, it's, 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 to, to um, engage with the Quito agenda, but it was very difficult. I mean, that, that sort of hard end of things, sort of rough seating, um, people without any form of accommodation aid, just yeah. wasn't where you no, wanted no, to go. It's, not, so it's not, very not. tricky. Yeah. But we do have, for the first time it appears, the right to the city is one of the known policy mm. units. It's all about the right to the city. So if we mm. so about London and exclusion mm. from London, then the right to city, the city as a concept uh, might be quite a powerful um, one. If you can ever turn that essentially a constitutional right into something. Mm. Um, other questions? We'll, we'll take two more tops so long as they're fairly short. Yeah, it's a question for everyone, really. And I'm Rebecca Press, and I look for one year housing association. And I'm a research officer with the Egyptian Travellers. And obviously, a lot of Egyptian Travellers are homeless through lifestyle choice and government policy, criminalising women on the side of the road. I know things have changed in Wales where um, councils do have a duty to care to house them. Um, has anyone got any experience of working with Egyptian Travellers and homelessness before? Let us speak to them. We have done policy work on it for about 10 years now. Um, so much else has come on the agenda. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, was there any of those people that I haven't myself, but there are, I know there are people that should go to Halloween University, so yeah, the KCRE, but it's colleagues of ours that have done work on it, which is quite recent. But yeah, there's very little in, in Wales, unfortunately. A lot of it's based. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't know the details of what they've done, yeah. but I just know that there's other. Um, because somebody else asked the same question recently mm -hmm. to do with the interest for they should go do some work in this area, and they seem to be the people who have done the most recent work, so they did a couple of years, and I'm not sure some, some of the most interesting work is, isn't done by academics or launch sector, it's done by private research companies yeah. when they're doing housing market assessments. So yeah. the go-to would be opinion research services in Wales, because they and they do it all across the UK, yes. where there's yeah. the quantitative element, and then they do a whole load of qualitative work. I remember 10 years ago sitting in a caravan doing an interview with the MD and being chased off a, a caravan site. I, I but they, they've come a long way since then. So. I felt like a couple and they didn't really have, mm -hmm. I've done more research than what oh, yeah. they did. Oh, they've, they've, they've done a lot now. If you do that, if you do those travels, you have me point to them that they are in historically with the Irish travels, but now also with the road of gypsies, and they see themselves as the, the lead research organisation. Who was that, sorry? Havi Point. Havi is the the name for the language the travellers use. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, the yeah. Use. So, no, that's me. But, but, as the was research. But, the, um, but yeah, Havi Point. And I can give you, I could, if you give me your contact oh, details, I can put you in touch with. We, we wouldn't directly work with travellers, and it would be see uh, travellers who are nomadic, but a lot of the families who are becoming homeless mm -hmm. are becoming are from traveller backgrounds, so there's yeah. a mixture there of they tend to larger families and that's a risk factor for homelessness and there's a lot of continuing uh, prejudice against them. That's where a lot of problems between friends are changing is. Mm. The ones that are older that were housed with big families and now have not got big families, so they've got the benefit, the, 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 the bedroom caps and there's the benefit cap and it's all chaos and chaos mm. and that really. We'll take one final question. If there is one, if there isn't, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pose the last one then. One of the issues that's come up frequently is around migration and uh, rights. What are your 
who should have access to the services in the respective jurisdictions that you've been talking about? Who should we exclude? Who should we include in terms of having a connection to the area? Where do you draw the line? It's that spectrum. So you're from outside a uh, politically drawn local boundary within Wales. You're from England. You're from uh, mainland Europe. You're from Eastern Europe. Actually, you're from outside of Europe. It, it, it's 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 not, I think the right to shelter has to be universal. Okay. I think that the idea um, that somebody, whatever the reason for being there, um, whether they have a legal right to be in the place or not, they should be allowed to sleep on the street is absolutely, should be completely out. out. Now, what happens to them then? The force of law and order might pick them up the following morning and put them on a boat, and that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that, 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 I think that the right to shelter should be absolute and that the public services should not exclude people from, and obviously charitable services shouldn't exclude people because they don't have a right to be in the country, it's a separate issue. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think it goes back to the point earlier about one of the benefits that the Welsh system was trying to get to was uh, getting away from a very black and white model, you get everything or you get nothing. Mm. And I think about having that kind of question is then um, the answer is about sort of grades of support rather than the city meets one model. And I do think for very sort of resource intensive invent uh, interventions, there is going to be a question about consent if you draw it too broadly. Um, but then there are other ways of, of helping because you say where it is much more of a basic offer um, and then you can have a wide pool. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that very much. And I think the way to show to many of you that it should be absolute if you're in this country. And actually, with this tuition point as well, I think anybody who is in the UK, not in the UK, should not be less If they're only to be in the country, you should be less than What you offer above that, I think, then does community, political, and policy and financial practicalities and I do think it has to be a debate. It's not just about evidence, it's not just about values and trade-offs and mm -hmm. so we make all personal views on it but um, but I think there has to be a bottom line where it really is a, a genuinely is a human rights issue mm -hmm. and um, so in the UK's boundaries it has, res it has a responsibility to everybody who's at least everybody who's lawfully within its boundaries yeah. and I would argue probably beyond that as well if you're not necessarily within the minimum that we should get. But that doesn't mean to say they have access to the full yeah. benefits to welfare state. I think that would be very uh, I'm sure we have two. <laughs> I'm only four weeks into this job. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting out of it that easily. Well, no. What I do know is when I worked in, uh, when I ran St. Paul's Night Shelter in Shasta Avenue in the uh, uh, 80s and the 90s, was, and at one point about 75% of people using the night shelter were from uh, Scotland. Ireland, both sides of the border, and the north of England. Um, and, uh, and I was one of those Scots who moved to it. And, and it wasn't really, any of people didn't really question the fact that you, know, you were Scottish, you came into London, you could get somewhere, you were Irish, you came into and, and, and there was, so there was like, well, there wasn't actually sort of Irish people in access at that time, but there was a, there was a, lot, more, a, lot, a lot more healthier debate about it. But there's something at the moment, there's something getting in the way of that debate. Um, and some bits where the evidence and what we know about it, and you know, why is it 54% of the love sleepers the last street crowd in London are Roma people? You know, why, why, uh, you know, why is it that over 50% of big issue vendors are from Eastern Europe? You know, we don't we don't get out and open and talk about it. You know, because at the moment we're, we're suppressing that debate. So I don't answer, but yeah. I'm happy to have the debate. Yeah, I think it's an important one. I think there's something really important that's happened what was in the UK is about the localised the localism stroke localisation debate, which you yeah. all touched on today, but have been, I think it's one of the most fundamental in the geography department as well. Yes. Um rather talk about that. But um but I mean I think that, that there's been a shift in policy. So there's the issue about people inward migration into the country, but then within the country what we've had is much, much stronger emphasis on and um, local connection, yeah. not just within the statutory homelessness system, but access, what is new is access to yeah. single yeah. homelessness, yeah. Yeah. or what's <coughs> not I mean, if, if growth deals and the demolition agenda start to devolve, more of the kind of budgets we're talking about, you know, so if you start to be a community as well, you give housing benefit to Manchester as part of the deal, you know, you can be sure Manchester will be one of the focus on resources on people in Greater Manchester. So there's a danger yeah. of debate going the other way yeah. Uh, yeah. At, at the moment. So we need to kind of pull that. That's what we're happening. We are spending a proportion, a very small proportion, of the homelessness budget in Cardiff 
Well, plus, if you're about to go to Tidville or Manchester or wherever they come, yeah. uh, we're one of the latest authorities. Yeah, yeah, no, so it's a very recent. It's a the reason I'm right. <laughs> hey, that's where I'm in. Just as the, you're probably aware of it, you may indeed have contributed to it, but the Piano Quanto was yeah. the Pianza publication is exactly on that. And it comes from a debate where the people concerned with international migration were saying, look, all these racist rules are being put out to say that you won't look after these people. And people who are working more at local level saying, well, the, the impact of those may be racist, that's sort of the debate. But actually, they are more about we don't, we're in Dublin, we don't want Cork people, or we're in Cardiff, we don't want Swansea people. And then those, and they're not stupid rules, they, they, they have got some sense behind them, but it's their excessive use is the, is the problem. And then they build up, and then obviously the, the, they exclude, they can then be used right, uh, to be xenophobic or racist. But that's a very useful publication, I think, in terms yeah, of exploring yeah. how that rule applies in more similar and different ways right across yeah. Europe. But it's actually, I mean, I ask it because I think it's one of the most pressing questions we have, irrespective of what system or services you have, who is eligible is to access that. But I did like the initial response. You messed it up after that, but the initial <laughs> response that says everyone should have a shelter. There's your, there's your global call. Everybody should have a shelter. Don't know where you're from. Um, yeah, the point is that, um, so what, I, I, I think locals and locals, local connections are really important. The UK point is the one that's uh, similar to but the, 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 the moving away from a national establishment, probably should be the point again, yeah. the, the, the legislation as a whole, moving away from a, a national minimum standard approach to yeah. tackle like, homelessness, poverty, and all the other issues, to a localised mm -hmm. approach, not only brings up the local connections, but it just means. That you have has been on you yeah. um, and you lose a sense of citizenship. In fact, it's a part of this human right, you lose a sense of citizenship. And I think out of all the things we talk about, that's the overriding anxiety within the UK of kind of the Nazi that I have uh, at the moment. So mm -hmm. the, the local connection point is one part, I think, of a bigger, yeah, yeah. a much bigger yeah. set of worries yeah. about yeah. how yeah. it will go on. Excellent. Dear Fumba, thank you very much for um, joining the 50 year reflection. Um, I shan't call it celebration, 50 year reflection. Um, uh, yes, thank you very much for our contributors. <laughs> Safe journey home. I'll <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>